All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome, welcome everybody. It's really cool to see all of you here. Um, we have a really great session for you today. My name is Julian. I'm a tech evangelist with AWS, and I focus on AI and machine learning. And um, I'm joined by two uh, special guests today from uh, Toyota Connected Data Services, Brian and Nimish, who uh, in a few minutes will tell you about um, computer vision use cases at, uh, at Toyota and, and machine learning at the edge. So let's get started. We're going to talk about um, machine learning at the edge first for a few minutes. Uh, why is this even a thing? And how is that different from machine learning in general? Um, then, of course, we're going to call out a few AWS services that help you build machine learning solutions at the edge. And then we'll dive into uh, the Toyota use case. And I'm not going to say anything about it because I want to keep, uh, I want to keep the show interesting. And, uh, and Brian and Nimish will actually uh, dive uh, pretty deep on uh, both the, the business justification and, uh, and the, the technical uh, solution that they used. Uh, once they're done, I'll be back and I'll talk about some alternative scenarios, some other uh, architectures that you could use for machine learning at the edge. And last but not least, uh, I will spend a few minutes talking about how can you optimize machine learning models for, uh, for performance at the edge. Okay, so some more technical uh, tips here. And of course, I'll share some resources to get you started. So first of all, let's look at machine learning at the edge. Um, as you probably know, the main problem that we face here is that for, I would say, most devices out there, wh whatever they are, uh, medical equipment, industrial machines, or you know, maybe off-planet uh, robots, like the one that just landed on, on Mars yesterday, um, it is impossible to use uh, cloud-based services to perform prediction, right? So even if those devices have tons of sensors and capture tons of data, there, there, there are good reasons why they cannot perform uh, cloud calls or remote calls to get prediction. So that's a, that's a problem that's not going to go away. And the reason for that is, of course, law of physics. Uh, you could be very, very far away from the nearest AWS region. Okay, I guess if you're off planet, you're pretty far away. Uh, I didn't hear any uh, region being announced for Mars, but you know, you never know. Maybe tomorrow, who knows? Um, but if we stay on planet Earth, um, there are regions where um, latency, network latency, network throughput um, is just uh, um, prohibitively. Um, uh, uh, slow and, and you just can't use that. Um, then even if you have connectivity, the cost of that connectivity could be just too high, right? Uh, if you have uh, satellite uplinks or, or any kind of fancy connectivity like that, it's never going to be uh, worth your money uh, to send all that data to the cloud. So you have to be able to process it and, and locally and predict locally. And the last reason is, of course, um, maybe you have privacy reasons, maybe you have regulatory constraints that prevent you from sending data outside a specific area. So how can we help here? So what, what we see most customers doing is they experiment and train models in the cloud, right? Um, they, they gather data, um, so they do that a few times to build a data set, and then they experiment and they train in the cloud. And we have plenty of options to do that. Uh, SageMaker is one of them. Uh, we have plenty of SageMaker sessions this week, so please make sure you learn about SageMaker if you're not familiar with it. Uh, it's a fully managed service that lets you build, uh, train, and deploy easily and at any scale. Um, but <clears throat> if you also would like uh, may, maybe even more control on, 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 and if you're not keen on working with fully managed infrastructure, you could still use, of course, the deep learning AMI, uh, which uh, um, packages all those popular deep learning libraries, and you can rely on, on different uh, instance families like C5 and P3. And again, last night, I, I, I believe you, uh, uh, you heard about the latest generation uh, of C5 and P3 that support 100 gigabit networking, uh, C5N and P3DN. So that's going to help training very, very large data sets. Okay, so I would say we've got you covered when it comes to working in the cloud, building models. But what about what about bringing those models to uh, your devices? 
Uh, so last year, actually, at reInvent, we launched a service called AWS Greengrass Machine Learning uh, that helps you bring machine learning models uh, easily uh, to uh, embedded uh, devices or edge devices. So, of course, you would start by training with SageMaker, just like I explained. Uh, you would write a Lambda function uh, that then, using a service called AWS Greengrass, gets deployed to your device. Okay, so using Greengrass, you will automatically deploy the code and uh, the, the Lambda code and the machine learning model to your device. Okay, and it doesn't matter if you're deploying to one device or a thousand devices, you know, uh, Greengrass is gonna take care of that. And then once the model and the Lambda function have been deployed to your device, um, then the Lambda kicks in, starts capturing data from whatever sensors are available on the device, and, and it uses the model to perform uh, inference, right, to, to run some predictions locally on the device without any communication back to, to the cloud, okay? And then if you'd like to, of course, if you can, if you have network connectivity, maybe you have connectivity five minutes per day or once a week, uh, you can push back some results some aggregated data on predicted data uh, back to uh, AWS for further analytics, okay? But if you don't have that, uh, if you can't close the loop because the device doesn't have any connectivity, it's still able to run locally and, uh, and predict. So <clears throat> this is how it would go, right? So you would train with SageMaker. Optionally, of course, you could still import your own model if you have trained a model outside of SageMaker, right? A Lambda function for prediction add both as resources to the Greengrass group, so the, the group of devices. It could be one single device, but it could also be one main device. Uh, we call it the Greengrass core, uh, with other smaller satellite devices communicating with it. And you just let Greengrass deploy it, okay? So create the Greengrass group, attach the Lambda function, attach the model, let Greengrass deploy uh, whenever it's able to, okay? So this way of doing things is best when you want the same programming model in the cloud and at the edge, okay? Because you will be running on your devices the exact same Lambda code as you wrote and tested in the cloud, okay? So there's no change, no need to learn um, any specific technology, write a Lambda function, test it in the cloud, deploy it to your devices. Um, if you need to update the code and the model frequently. Uh, this is a, a good way to do it because, again, Greengrass takes the deployment pain away, right? Imagine deploying to one million models, uh, one million devices, sorry. Um, at any given point, some devices will be on, some will be off, some will have network connectivity, some won't, okay? It's a nightmare if you have to manage that manually. So let Greengrass handle that, okay? Um, and like I said, Greengrass has this uh, group structure where you could have a core device running prediction and other tiny, uh, I call them satellite devices, connected to it uh, that are just maybe sensors uh, sending data to, uh, to the Greengrass core. So the requirements are, of course, that the devices should be powerful enough to run AWS Greengrass. Okay, so this excludes the tiniest of devices and they need to be provisioned in another AWS service called AWS IoT Core. Um, and that means basically you need to install a certificate and a key pair on that device for authentication and encryption, okay? So if you can do that, you can run Greengrass and you can enjoy model deployment in, in an easy way. Um, last year as well, we launched uh, that pretty cool device called DeepLens, which is a good real life example of uh, using um, AWS Greengrass to deploy models. So I'm guessing most of you are familiar with DeepLens now. Again, if, uh, if you're not, we have a more DeepLens session this year. Um, now you can actually buy this device on, uh, on Amazon.com. It's a really cool uh, Christmas gift, just saying. Uh, and, you know, this is the best device to get educated on deep learning. You know, it's, it's, it's fine to play with EC2 instances and SageMaker, et cetera, but at the end of the day, you want to deploy to proper device and see things actually happening, right? Filming things and predicting uh, video streams, et cetera. And that's what DeepLens is, okay? It's a collaboration with Intel. And so it works um, exactly like I said. Um, you train a model in the cloud, Okay, uh, we have some sample projects for you to try. 
you, uh, you write a simple lambda function that's going to capture the video stream, predict it with the model, and, uh, and, and return it back to, to the camera. And, and you just attach that to a green grass group and deploy to deep lens, OK? So um, it's, it's not much more complicated than that, really. And if we look at an example, OK, so this is a, a real life example. And uh, if you guys have, have kids, right, and uh, if you want to have fun uh, teaching your kids about AI and deep learning with deep lens, it's pretty fun, right? I, I recommend it. We had a good time doing this. So what you see here is really it's a picture of my TV. Uh, I connected the deep lens to my TV. And I use an object detection model to figure out in real time what's in there. And uh, it's a little too tiny to read, but uh, you see that the chair and the sofa in the back are detected. And uh, my laptop is detected as well. And my son and myself are detected as persons, right? So that's reassuring. Um, and this all takes place in real time, locally on the camera, thanks to the model that has been deployed by uh, Greengrass, and thanks to uh, the Lambda function running uh, over and over predicting that video stream, OK? So go and try it out. Um, so you can use your own model with deep lens. Um, you can use the sample models that we provide. Or you could, like I said, you could train models. And uh, deep lens supports uh, a variety of TensorFlow, CAFE, and uh, MXNet models, um, which you can deploy and, and run directly on deep lens um, using Greengrass. OK, and this is an example from a, a previous conference a few weeks ago. And as you can see, there were quite a few people detected in here. So you can really go beyond the sample projects and experiment. Okay? Uh, last but not least, we have community projects. We run a hackathon this year, and we had some very, very exciting community projects being built on deep lens, and you will also find them on the AWS website. And of course, you can grab them, tweak them, and, and build more of your own. Okay? Um, and I would like to uh, invite <coughs> uh, Brian on stage. There you are. <laughs> Uh, Brian for, is from uh, Toyota uh, Connected, and he's going to talk about uh, what the use cases are, what the use cases are for uh, machine learning at the edge at Toyota, and he's going to give you some great examples. So please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. You guys hear me? Check, check. OK. Great. So uh, just a show of hands real quick, who here has heard of Toyota Connected? One, two, that's what I thought. Okay, not, not too many. Not, not, now, not Toyota, but Toyota Connected. Still? Wish I had a deep lens. I can actually count the number of people's hands up right now. So um, Toyota Connected is a, a relatively new company. We're about three years old, and um, we were founded with the idea to really kind of support Toyota Motor North America in all of their technology needs, specifically for... Um, uh, things uh, dealing with the connected vehicle. Let's see, do I have this? I think I got a problem here. Oh, there we go. So we are located about a mile away from the uh, corporate office. All right. There we go. And we did this purposely. And the reason for this was that we wanted to, Toyota Connected to have its own culture, its own identity. So. When we're looking at the things that we focus on, yes, it's connected vehicle data, but we wanted to kind of take this idea of building our own identity, our own culture, and really doing something a little bit different than the other Toyota companies. So we'll have things, you know, very similar to a lot of startups, right? Uh, you know, we have um, uh, bring your pets in. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, catered um, food at, at the company uh, with vegan options, which myself and Namish are very uh, thankful for. Um, uh, but we also have this sense of really curiosity. And it's, it's something that we really instill with all of our employees to just be curious and really think outside the box. And so when we started looking at the connected vehicle, um, our vehicles, uh, wow, this, there we go. So, the Toyota uh, connected car, um, it has thousands of sensors. And under the hood, really, you're looking at uh, probably about 500 or so that are streamed in near real time. And so the average Toyota customer drives about 48 minutes per day. That's about 500 plus unique data points and roughly about 7.2 million data points per connected vehicle per day. Now, all of this data really kind of comes down to two primary use cases. We look at building data services for our customers to really drive that customer satisfaction 
and, and really kind of give the customer new capabilities around safety um, as, as well as convenience. The second one is to really kind of take that data and use it to improve our products. And so while we've been doing that for about three years now, a number of folks have been talking about, well, what's next for Toyota Connected? And so when I was in Japan probably about six months ago, um, I got pulled into a room with uh, one of the product teams, and they really said, you know, Brian, we want, we want your advice. We, we, we have these ideas. We think it's possible, but we really want to understand how, how far away from reality are we. And so we started talking, and, and really what it came down to was the idea that the vehicles of the future would have cameras and eventually be able to push the data out of the vehicle. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to understand can we take this video, very specifically video, and do positive things for the world, do things that really no other car manufacturer is doing to make the world a better place. And so as we started getting through some of these use cases, I just found them absolutely fascinating. So they were asking questions like, can we detect and alert drivers about things like tornadoes or, or um, weather conditions that are so dangerous, but being able to do it faster and quicker than traditional means? You know, could we understand things like when I drive by a bunch of trash, could I let the um, uh, city know that uh, there's a bunch of trash in the, in the middle of the road, go and dispatch a unit to actually clean that up? Or if I'm driving by, let's say, uh, a building every day, but I notice there's graffiti on it, can we also report that and have that cleaned up? As we started going through these use cases, you know, some of the obvious ones came up you know, around mapping to try to understand, well, if this uh, speed, speed limit changes or if there's a detour, um, can I update the map so that we now reroute the car to a, uh, a different route knowing that these real-time updates have come? So almost like a ways without having to actually press the button there. Um, and then we started talking about you know, things like mall drop-offs and, and things that really don't appear on the map, right? Because they're just so very specific, right? You know, you could drop off uh, your kids at the theater and there's probably three or four really great places to drop them off, right? But none of those will really show up on the GPS. And how can we use that data to now move from an autonomous perspective to let the autonomous vehicles of the future understand where those drop-offs are? We also started looking at things around, well, what else can we do, such as if a car is driving by a transportation um, bus stop, if there's no one at the bus stop, could we let the bus, um, the, the city uh, a bus system know to reroute to where people are? And if there's too many people, could we actually now send a second bus um, inside the car, right? If we know that there's multiple occupants, um, could we make sure that if there is a crash, that we deploy enough um, uh, ambulances to that crash site based on the number of potential occupants that are in there. And really kind of thinking of everything we can do that would in ensure that the safety uh, and the alerts happening outside of the car can be detected as well as safety inside the car. And as we started going through all these use cases, my head was spinning, but one of the things that really just, just stood out is the answer is we can, but the cost it just didn't make sense. Transferring data, all the video data to the cloud is just impossible. As a matter of fact, 7.5 million vehicles, right? We, we did the calculation. One camera just taking a random minute of video from the vehicle, uploading that to, to um, the cloud, the cost would would be billions of dollars a year, right? Not millions, billions. And that's just the transfer. That's not the storage. That's not the processing, right? And at that point, you know, you, we, we got a lot of sad faces in the room, right? You know, people were just like, gosh, you know, I wish there was something we can do because we think there's something there. And the reality is there is something there, but it's not taking that data and pushing it to the cloud. It's not, you know, just collecting data for the sake of collecting and figuring out what we're gonna do with it later, the, the, the solution is on the edge, right? And, and the, the, the solution really becomes that Toyota's edge is the vehicle. And putting the hardware in the vehicle that allows us to do this compute, right, is, is gonna be just a game changer uh, uh, for all automotive companies. And so 
when I got, got home, I was really excited, but the reality is, is that you know, putting these, this, this, this type of hardware um, in a vehicle immediately right, is, is not something that's, that's very realistic. Right? These things take time, you have to build business cases, and you really have to prove the concept out. And so as I was researching this, I came across a device, and it really kind of sparked the imagination. It sparked the curiosity. And so you know, I called up our AWS rep, I said, hey, I saw this device, uh, it, was, it was announced uh, last uh, reInvent, can you get me one? Because they're not available. And he's like, oh, yeah, I, I, I think I can. We got the device, we got the team in the room, we spent about $117 worth of Thai food that night, and um, we just started hacking away. And so uh, to, to talk about the journey, right, uh, that we had with this device, and, and really kind of our journey of discovery um, is from our team, our data scientist, Namish. So, may I hand it over? Come to this. Hey, everyone. So once we had this opportunity to learn about SageMaker and how we can build and train our models in the cloud, and then we have a green grass device in the form of deep lens that we could use to put our models on the device itself, uh, we were looking at some of the problems that we could solve. Uh, and something that came to our mind uh, was a distracted driver application. So if you look at the NHTSA stats over the last few years, just in the United States alone, uh, thousands and thousands of people either lose their lives or get severely injured uh, because of a distraction uh, during driving. This distraction could be you could be texting, uh, you could be talking on the phone, uh, you could be reaching behind, which apparently seems not so harmful, uh, but the stats do not lie. So we thought this is a great opportunity for us to do something about this and see uh, if we can use the edge technology uh, to come up with a solution for this. So again, redefining the problem statement, it's pretty simple. Uh, can you detect when a, when a driver is driving, can you detect that distraction in real time uh, and be able to do something about it? So what we did was uh, we had our car simulator at Toyota, uh, and we had a bunch of volunteers uh, from uh, the company itself posing these different things. So essentially, we broke down the problem uh, into, let's say, texting, uh, talking on the phone, reaching behind, and of course, your normal safe driving posture. So the arduous task, I would say here, was uh, to create this data, right? We see a lot of problems uh, in most of the machine learning that we do not have good data or we do not have enough good labeled data. So this was a manual process for us to be able to have different drivers try all these poses. Uh, and we use the deep lens. Uh, and if you see the deep lens, it has like a wide lens camera, almost like the entire scene is being captured. Uh, so it, it, it does require some pre-processing on our side when we are creating that data or taking videos of different drivers. Uh, some of the things that we had to keep in mind uh, was that uh, the drivers that you've used to create your training data uh, should not be uh, showing up in your validation. Uh, another thing that we will have to do uh, is, let's say a particular driver in your training data has poses for only texting. Uh, that's, that's not a great deal because it tends to overfit, and you do not want your machine learning models to uh, learn driver-specific details. You want it to learn the posture-specific details. So there was a lot of work around making sure that we get the right data from the camera to be able to pursue that. So once we had the problem ready, uh, our approach to solve this was transfer learning, right? So most of the computer vision problems out there today, uh, there is a go-to, a very safe bet on how you can get the best results, and that is transfer learning. If you see the commercial success over the last few years of different machine learning methods, transfer learning is the way to go. Um, again, for us, uh, depending upon what kind of use case you have, uh, let's say uh, the model that you're trying to learn from or transfer learn from, uh, you have the data which is very similar to that, but then at the same time, you, have, you do not have enough data, you have very small data for it, then you probably need to use that uh, model and just train the last few classifiers. Uh, however, uh, in our case, uh, we had the data which was slightly different from what the transfer learning model we want to inherit or learn from. And so essentially, the way we use transfer learning for this problem was to just extract the features and then build our own classifier to be able to find a solution. So moving ahead. Not sure. All right, so the model that we went ahead with is a residual network or a REST net. Uh, we know that the deep learning network, essentially the first few layers 
uh, learn the, um, the middle layers learn the shape, the first few layers learn the features, uh, and then of course you have your fully connected layer or your classifier towards the end. Uh, but the problem that occurs is, uh, as you know, everybody talks about, hey, let's let's make a deep neural network. But as you increase the number of layers, it increases, uh, it affects the model accuracy. It gets saturated, and sometimes even further decreases. Uh, so the residual network or the ResNet that we went for uh, kind of uh, helps in uh, solving this uh, gradient problem. And the way it does is that uh, essentially the hypothesis is that it's easier to map the residuals instead of mapping the actual feature. So let's say you want a function f of x from y. Uh, you can, instead of mapping that, you should map f of x plus x. And as long as your identity function is optimal, f of x equals to 0 is a residual mapping which is easier to solve. So again, going to the technical details, but the overall idea was that ResNet is awesome and ResNet allows us to be able to find a solution for this. And the deep lens, uh, the entire green grass framework that we have uh, supports the ResNet because it has MXNet running in the back end, which is pretty lightweight. So that was our go-to solution uh, for ResNet. Uh, some of the pre-processing that we had to do. So like I mentioned, uh, for our transfer learning, we did not have enough data. It was a manual process to be able to create uh, these images of different poses uh, and so the way we had to make sure that A, we have enough data for good training, and B, uh, also make sure that the model does not overfit, uh, we had to introduce some noise in our data uh, and also make it less prone to overfitting. So we did uh, several image augmentation, so pretty standards like random rotations, uh, random cropping, the red, blue, green mean centering, and some other translations. Uh, essentially, this was all done to make our model more robust. So whenever you see um, a low lighting condition or you see something where there's a new driver with a different angle or a different pose uh, or a different uh, you know, personality in many ways, uh, your, your model does not uh, fail on those things. So that was the image augmentation that was done. Uh, talking about more pre-processing and the hyperparameter tuning, so again, a shout out to SageMaker because it provides a very convenient uh, hyperparameter tuning job, uh, which is very similar to what you have a grid search, right? Uh, basically, all your parameters that you want to tune, uh, you would pass those ranges, uh, put in some data, and the SageMaker uh, hyperparameter tuning job would give you the best parameters that you could use uh, to be able to create a solution for you. So the way we did it is, uh, again, the ResNet, uh, it does not, uh, take the full image of the deep lens. It requires a 224 by 224. So we had to downsample all the images, making sure that we do not lose any information while we are doing that. Uh, about about 50 epochs were required for us to train this ResNet 152 model. Uh, the image shape I mentioned, the learning rate, the other parameters are there for you to see. Uh, important thing is another, the optimizer. Uh, the SGD basic optimizer worked pretty well for us. So once we had this uh, feature extraction from the ResNet model and then we used our own classifier to uh, effectively fine tune our train model. So uh, talking about the entire end-to-end -end pipeline for our model, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, you have a deep lens that is taking images in real time. Uh, it's on while you're driving. Uh, what's happening now is that this deep lens is sending the images in an S3 bucket uh, and at the same time, you have a lambda function configured on the device itself. Now, what that lambda function does uh, is it loads your machine learning model. So you have your model trained in the cloud, right, uh, in SageMaker. Then uh, the model artifacts, which is essentially a JSON file uh, and a parameters file, right? So you deploy those things to the device, and the Greengrass provides a pretty convenient environment to be able to deploy your models. Uh, and then it uses something called an Intel Atom Optimizer. Uh, now what this does is uh, your params file is converted into an intermediate uh, representative file, which is memory optimized and storage optimized. So even though the MaxNet is pretty lightweight, uh, once you train your model, uh, the artifacts, they become really optimized for running on an edge device. Again, so your deep lens, uh, the Lambda is running on it. It sees the image of the driver. It does some pre-processing, uh, similar to the data augmentation that I talked about, uh, and then creates a JSON. 
Uh, now, this JSON essentially has uh, the predicted probabilities of each class, uh, as well as the label of the class, the class name. Uh, and of course, the, there is also uh, the image link, the S3 uh, bucket image link, because the way we are using this uh, is that this image, uh, this entire JSON is sent to an MQTT topic, and from that MQTT topic, there is a mobile application infrastructure, a Node.js server, which is using SNS to listen. So it needs to know where that particular image lives, and that's where the S3 link is coming from. So with that said, uh, we do not have a simulator here to demonstrate a real distracted driver, but we did make a video, so I'm just gonna play that next. The last frame was pretty embarrassing. I should have removed that from the video. <laughs> All right, so it was a great journey for me personally, uh, getting to know machine learning on the edge. Uh, and the entire green grass environment made it really easy to be able to have a problem, learn from it, and see how it looks in real life. And there were some learnings and there were some challenges. So I'm going to speak about that now. Uh, so one of the things that we always do in machine learning is uh, ensemble results, right? Uh, you don't necessarily trust one model to give you the most accurate results. Uh, you want to know you have different uh, kind of models, and you ask each one of them, hey, what do you think about this prediction? And hey, what do you think about this prediction? Uh, you could have different things like a hard voting or a soft voting. Maybe you take an arithmetic mean of the predictions. Many things, right? Uh, but currently at Edge, uh, it's for performance uh, things, uh, having one model uh, is, is, is enough. You, you, you cannot have multiple models because of the memory and other constraints that the deep lens has. So ensemble learning, uh, having multiple models, is something that is still a work in progress in many ways for deep lens, uh, and that's not available right now. The other thing that I learned was that the image pre-processing is really the key uh, in the sense that, especially owing to the fact that the deep lens has a very wide lens camera, uh, it becomes really important for you to be able to make sure that when you're using it to have some predictions, you cut out the irrelevant parts and just give model the most specific and the most important parts of it. And that significantly improves the accuracy and other things. So image pre-processing is the key. Uh, the other thing was that uh, a model has different confidence levels for different classes, right? Some models perform good on a particular class and some for others. So clipping, uh, sort of setting thresholds to say that, hey, if you think that this is a texting class or a talking class, then uh, you should be at least this much uh, uh, confident in your predictions or probability threshold uh, was something that did not work very well uh, during this training process. Uh, and finally, the most important thing I would say is that, uh, especially when you're talking about inferencing at the edge, it is more important 
how often you run that inference depending upon your use case rather than basic things like what is your model accuracy, what is your F1 score, and things like that. Because really there are lots of moving pieces to it, things like, hey, uh, the lambda calls that are happening, the S3 object that you are always, the image that you're always putting in inside. If you do it in real time all the time, that's just not memory efficient and that's just not performance efficient as well. So it, it's, it really depends on what your business use case is to be able to say that, hey, this, my business logic makes sense to run inference only uh, once every five seconds or have some logic of that sort. Because uh, at Edge, you cannot have inference running all the time. So that's all I had. I'm going to hand again to Julian to continue this. Thank you very much. Very good, thanks. <laughs> All right, I hope no one here uh, drives like that, okay? Uh, how, where do I get one of those cool simulators? Can, can I do racing on that? Come on. <laughs> very great, very, very cool. Um, so let's look at, um, let's look at optimizing uh, performance uh, for, uh, for inference. So when we talk about constraint devices um, similar to deep plants or possibly smaller ones, of course, we're facing uh, devices who have limited, uh, limited memory, limited processing power, limited storage. Everything's, everything's a problem. So of course, we could take uh, vanilla machine learning models that we trained, and, uh, and we could deploy them. But the, 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 the computational capability of those devices uh, is going to make prediction a little slow. So, there's a whole uh, bunch of techniques that try to make the model smaller, okay, from a memory footprint point of view, um, to make it easier to, uh, to predict with, to, to reduce uh, computational complexity, and, and as, as a byproduct, try to reduce power consumption, which, again, is always going to be a problem when you work on a, you know, in constrained environments. So, there are a number of techniques to do this. Um, one of them is to actually um, compile, so to speak, the, the vanilla model into uh, a hardware-specific representation. And uh, Nimish mentioned the, uh, the Intel um, inference engine, which is actually what is uh, running on, on deep plants. So um, if you're running, let's say, uh, an Apache MXNet or a TensorFlow model on deep plants, uh, you are not running MXNet or TensorFlow on deep plants. That would be probably a little too heavy. So we're actually running an optimized version of the model on that Intel inference engine. And we can also use um, um, hardware optimized libraries like uh, Intel MKL, a math kernel library, which is a collection of uh, hardware optimized mathematical routines that are obviously heavily used when you do uh, uh, deep learning uh, predictions like convolution, et cetera, et cetera. All these can be implemented in an optimized fashion um, using the hardware architecture. So that's what MKL does for Intel platforms. There's an open source project called NNPAC um, that does the same for uh, Intel architectures and uh, ARM 7 uh, architectures, so, such as the, uh, the Raspberry Pi. And I'm a big fan of the Raspberry Pi. Um, and actually, if you watched the, the keynote last night, uh, you may have heard about uh, a new service that we're launching. Uh, it's called uh, Amazon SageMaker Neo, and it, it's uh, our own solution to uh, compile models for a specific hardware architecture uh, and then run them using a, a hardware-specific runtime on this architecture. So we support Intel architectures, NVIDIA architectures, um, DeepLens is, is part of that, uh, Raspberry Pi is part of that, and you know, with more to come. So keep an eye out for, uh, for uh, SageMaker Neo. Uh, there should be a blog post on that coming out soon. Uh, there are other techniques uh, which are more advanced. Um, trying to uh, shrink the weights and the activations inside the model. Okay, so by default, all the weights in the neural network are gonna be 32-bit, okay? Um, and as it turns out, and activations value as well, and as it turns out, you can shrink from 32 to 16 to 8, and some, some models actually use one bit weights, which sounds a little bit crazy, but it, it works really well. And the purpose is always the same. Of course, 
If the weights are smaller, then the, the model itself is going to be smaller, so you're going to save storage space. And as you probably know, it's also much cheaper to perform 16-bit or 8-bit arithmetic than it is to perform 32-bit floating point arithmetic. So you save on, on processing power, and you save on, on power itself. Okay? So using techniques like quantization, so um, uh, shrinking to uh, uh, smaller weights, uh, mixed mode training, so training with 32-bit, but actually uh, after each training round, shrinking from, uh, uh, truncating from 32 to 16, et cetera. All these techniques help you get to smaller and faster models with minimal loss of accuracy. Uh, pruning is another technique where um, we'll remove automatically connections that are useless. So um, how, how could connections be useless? That's, a, that's an interesting discussion uh, beyond the scope of this, uh, of this talk. But there are ways to actually kill uh, connections that make, that have little or no impact on, on your predictions. Okay, so again, by removing weights, um, you store less parameters for the model and you end up with a smaller and faster model. And uh, compression uh, is, uh, is an interesting technique as well, where uh, you can actually use a number of compression techniques to encode the, the weights into uh, a smaller, um, more compact representation. Again, saving storage space and, um, and, and making the models uh, easier to, to deploy on those, on those devices. So m that sounds like science fiction, but as it turns out, some of these techniques uh, are uh, actually implemented and available in MXNet or, or TensorFlow. Uh, so mixed mode training is available, quantization is available, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And like I said, uh, you can now use uh, SageMaker Neo to, uh, to do this, to do some of this automatically, okay? And you end up with a faster model optimized for the hardware architecture that you have. Um, and then you can actually bring more complex models to, to tiny things like deep lens or Raspberry Pi. So what if local inference is not possible? Okay, uh, let's say you, you just don't have the processing power to run local prediction, um, or you're working on a, maybe an exotic uh, hardware platform that doesn't benefit from all those optimizations that I mentioned. So let's imagine that the device, let's imagine two scenarios, okay? The first one is the device supports, can support HTTPS, and the second scenario obviously is it cannot, okay? So what if you have a device that supports HTTPS? So obviously, um, you, the easy way out here would be train a model in the cloud with SageMaker, let's say, deploy it to a SageMaker endpoint, and invoke this endpoint from the device, okay? So train a model or import your own, deploy it uh, to prediction endpoint, and if you're familiar with SageMaker, you know this is a, this is a simple thing, and, and you can just run HTTPS uh, prediction, so HTTP post to the endpoint, um, the data that has been captured from the, the sensors, and receive prediction results. Okay, so that's a, simple, that's a simple solution to that problem. So this is best if the device is not powerful enough for local inference, okay? So there's no way you can run, a, um, a, 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 let's say, a CNN or convolutional neural network like the one Nimish mentioned. It, it's too slow, um, so you can't do that. Uh, maybe another problem would be that it's very difficult or maybe impossible to deploy models. To, to devices, you don't have a deployment uh, system in place. Uh, maybe you don't have any storage on that device either. Um, maybe you also need some cloud-based data for prediction. Maybe the device is just capturing part of the data, but actually you need to pull some cloud-based data stored in one of our backends to run that prediction, okay? So you can't run that prediction locally because you don't have all the data locally, okay? And maybe you want all prediction activity to be centralized, and there are many reasons for that. Uh, one could be, I don't know, security, compliance, or it could be technical reasons, but if you need to run all prediction in one place, then obviously it cannot happen at the edge, okay? Um, so the requirements are obvious. Uh, like I said, the device must support HTTP, HTTPS, actually, and you need to have network uh, connection uh, connectivity whenever you need it, okay? You might not be all the time, but whenever you need it, of course, you need the network to do that HTTPS call. So that's a scenario that could work. Now, what if you have a device 
that makes your life a little more difficult by not supporting HTTPS. Um, so here, my best option <laughs> would be to use uh, IoT messages to post IoT messages from the device and trigger a Lambda function running in the cloud. So you would train a model in SageMaker or import your own, deploy it to a prediction endpoint, write a, a cloud-based Lambda function that performs prediction. Okay, so this time we're not deploying to uh, that Lambda function to the, the device because we're not using green grass in this case. Okay, so we have a cloud-based Lambda function. And the device could send um, an MQTT message to uh, AWS IoT Core, okay, our IoT gateway. So post, um, uh, publish, actually, it's a publish subscribe message. So publish uh, an MQTT message that would trigger the Lambda function. The Lambda function would run the prediction uh, with the SageMaker endpoint, get some results, and push uh, an MQTT message with the results back to the device. Okay, that's um, kind of a low key solution, but it, it does work. Um, so this one is best if your device are so constrained that you cannot have local inference and you cannot have HTTP uh, connectivity. And uh, um, I'm, I'm very fond of Arduino devices as well. <laughs> this would be an example. And, or maybe you're just trying to keep cost as low as possible. So you really, really, um, you really want to have um, the minimal amount of stuff running. And here, as you know, the Lambda function only generates a charge when it's invoked. So you would actually um, probably minimize the spend by just running prediction whenever it's actually needed, whenever it's actually uh, called by, uh, uh, triggered by this MQTT message. Uh, the requirements are, of course, network connectivity, even though MQTT is less demanding than HTTP from all Point of, or points of view, you know, bandwidth and, uh, and uh, processing power and et cetera. So um, you could really you run MQTT on very, very tiny things. And obviously, they need to be provisioned in IoT Core. So you still need to be able to deploy a certificate or a key pair on that device. And that could be done on demand or it could be done at manufacturing time. There are different ways to do this. But even something really, really tiny could still get uh, access to a machine learning model through IoT and MQTT and Lambda. So there are, there, there's hope for those uh, little guys as well. So how do you get started? Uh, so obviously, we have a top-level URL called ml.awfs, pretty good name. You'll find information on all the uh, machine learning-related services. Uh, you can go to the, uh, the service pages for uh, SageMaker, uh, the deep learning uh, AMIs, which I mentioned, uh, Greengrass, Greengrass ML, Deep plans, okay, so plenty of information, uh, documentation, customer use cases, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to, to get you started. Uh, and if you're interested in those topics, uh, machine learning, deep learning, SageMaker, Raspberry Pis, and so on, uh, well, I tend to uh, write uh, um, blog posts on those topics at, uh, at this URL on Medium. Uh, so you could find that interesting as well. And I'd like to call uh, uh, Brian and Nimish back on stage just for a second. Uh, please give them a warm uh, round of applause. <clears throat> <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm really, really looking forward to, uh, to our cars being uh, you know, safe and smart, thanks to you guys. Yep. And please don't drive the way you, you, you saw those, uh, <laughs> those guys uh, driving, right? Um, you can keep in touch. Uh, we have uh, you know, Twitter accounts, email, so uh, if you have questions, uh, later on, please uh, please reach out, and uh, and we'll stay uh, we'll stay some more to to answer your questions. So if you have questions, please come to the stage, and uh, we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much for showing up, and uh, please enjoy the rest of the event. Bye bye. Thank you.